So last week, uh, we talked about unity, what unity is by definition, and what unity is not by definition. Uh, and we talked about how powerful unity is in both the physical, when we put our minds together, right, toward, toward one goal, but also in the spiritual, when we align ourselves with God's word, and we start to pray in alignment with God's word, and act in alignment with God's word, that unity is way more powerful than physical unity. We're actually going to read scripture about that today. But anyway, uh, and then we also read, so our, our scripture was from 1 Kings, I think it was chapter 10, 1 Kings 10, anybody? That's it, 1 Kings 10. There you go. If, if you weren't here and you didn't watch it, then, then you missed it. We had a little, um, a little snafu with um, one of the scripture references that I that I used. Uh, it was completely planned on my part as a test to make sure that you guys are checking me when I say something that you're like, uh, no, Pastor, that's not what it says. Like, right? So anyway, you can if you if you want to laugh at me, you can watch the sermon video and, and do that. But first Kings 10, we looked at from scripture how sin and disunity and infighting destroy both individuals, mm -hmm. it destroys individuals first, and then destroys families, and then destroys entire nations. Entire nations are destroyed when there's a lack of unity caused by sin, personal sin. And we were reminded that we, the church, we are the church. Anybody? We are the church, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not... It's not this building, it's not the building down the street this way, it's not the building down the street this way, it's, yes. the, it's the people of God coming together in unity, that's what makes the body of Christ, the church. We are the family of God, and this was one of our key points, is that our allegiance is to God and to his word. Our primary allegiance, our primary source of belonging in this world, in this life, is to belong to God and to, to obey his word. And if we, if we claim allegiance or we, we find belonging, a sense of belonging from anything less than God and his word and his church, then we're going we're gonna to veer off. We're going to not be united and, and we're going to get frayed and vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. So in today... Today's part two of United We Stand, Divided We Fall. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians. So if you can either make a note. We have note sheets over here on the side, by the way. And there's pens in the basket behind Brother Isaiah's. If you need either of those, um, I really encourage you to have a Bible. If you didn't bring a Bible, but you would like one, um, Brother Paul, if anybody needs a Bible, can get you one out of the, the usher cabinet there. Um, I, I want to make sure, whether it's on your phone, or a physical Bible, or whatever, that, that you eat it for yourself. Okay? I'm not here to treat you like a little kid and spoon feed you the Word of God. You need to eat it for yourself, because you're big boys and big girls, right? Amen. <laughs> eat it yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, if you're... It's totally okay if you're like, I don't know where that is. 1 Corinthians is in the New Testament, which is going to be towards the back, actually, of your, your Bible. The four Gospels are there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Acts, and the book of Romans, and the letter to the Corinthians. Are you there? 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 10. And this is the question that we're going to be asking today of ourselves as we read this portion of Scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 uh, through 31. This question, what are you united with? So we're talking about united we stand, 
divided we fall, today we're going to ask ourselves this question. What are you, or what am I, united with? What have I linked myself to? I'll, I'll not go farther into that on a tangent. So, I'm actually going to start out with a demonstration. I haven't done this in a while, so I was kind of excited about it. Um, I was going to call for youth, but we, like, I guess all our youth are over in the other building with Nancy. Um, so I'm going to bring up all you, uh, all you st strong men. And if you don't think that you're strong, still, you still have to come up. Okay. So just, just come real quick. All of you, this is a group, group demonstration. And what you can do is just kind of between these two poles, just kind of gather, gather around real quick and just, you know, have to wear a mask, but I'm just going to be considerate and uh, put mine on and talk extra loud so that we can we can do this. Okay. So last week, is this going to work for me? It's going to work by faith. It's going to work. There we go. Last week, I shared with you guys one of Aesop's fables. And this week, we have another one, because it's really helpful. Okay, This is a story called The Bundle of Sticks. And it tells of a man whose children, so you guys are representing my children. I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the man. You guys are my children, okay? It's a story of his children who it says they often quarrel among themselves. And to show them the benefit of working together, instead of quarreling, he brought them a bundle of sticks. Now, I brought this bundle of sticks that I made at my house uh, Friday. And just in case any of you were going to be smart and be like, well, I bet you know those sticks are like some kind of crazy whatever. This is not a trick, okay? So... I only have a few, but like, just, just hold on to that for a second. Hold on to that for a second. You hold on to that for a second. Is that a screen coming here for me? In front of this pole? Yeah, hang on to that for a second. Oh yeah, go ahead. Take the thicker one. Yeah. You're a strong guy. Who else? All right. So, just, just for fun, see if you can break that. Oh, okay. All right. So they're breakable sticks? They're not some weird, like, unbreakable stick, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to pass this bundle of sticks around, and I want you to break that. <laughs> Damn. No, don't say you can't. Come on. Break that thing. Uh, break it? Well, maybe not, like... <laughs> I can't break it. I can't do it with my hands. No. All right. Pass it down. I bet, I bet you can. <laughs> Look at this guy. Come on. Break that thing. No, what are you doing? Get out of here. No? Who else? Here we go. Evan, you're a strong guy. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt yourself. I already did. Look at that. Look at the bad wrist. Oh, yeah. Well, it depends on somebody that has a good wrist. I wouldn't be able to break it if I didn't have a good wrist. Oh, I thought you were going to get it off. I did. Christopher. Yeah, come on. Show us how to do it. Zach. Zach works out. Yes. Don't mess up my example, Zach. All right. The bundle, right? The bundle. When when the when the sticks were individual, they were easily broken, yes? Yes. When they stick together tightly, not easily right. broken. Mm -hmm. Yeah? They protect each other. Thank you guys. You can keep your broken sticks. <laughs> yeah, you keep those. So the story goes. To show them the benefit of working together, he brings them a bundle of sticks. And he asks them to break the bundle of sticks. And like we demonstrated, they can't break it when they're bundled together. However, when they're separated, if you take these out of here, 
They're easily broken, right? So I'm going to leave that here as a visual, I think. So this is the, this is the moral that the father teaches his children from the story. He says, my children, if you are of one mind, united to assist each other, you will be as this bundle, uninjured, listen, uninjured by all the attempts of your enemies. But if you are divided among yourselves, if you allow yourselves to become isolated or separated, you will be broken as easily as these things. Right? They snap those single ones like twigs, because mm -hmm. that's what they are. You're not that strong in and of yourself. I hate to be the one to break it to you. <laughs> See, break it to you. <laughs> a couple, couple people, yeah. You, know, say something you will be broken as easily as these sticks. And what we're going to see in 1 in Corinthians here is that the early church, you know, we love to talk about the early church in church. We're like, oh, the early church, like they had it, man. If we could just get back to, to what they had, like, like people talk about it like we would have no problems if we could be like the early church. Well, let me tell you something. The early church, they were unified under the cross of Christ. That's where their strength and power came from. They were unified. Until the day that somebody, it doesn't say who, somebody decided to claim allegiance to someone or something other than Christ, other than Jesus. So let's read it. First Corinthians. I don't remember what my next slide is. I guess, I guess you're going to have to help me, Ethan, because this is not... This is not doing anything. All right. First Corinthians 10. Oh, sorry. First Corinthians 1, 10 through 31. <clears throat> so Paul is writing to the church. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Okay? <clears throat> Everybody got it? You ready? First Corinthians. Chapter 1, verses 10 through 31. Paul says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Doesn't that sound kind of similar to the, the moral of the story that the father told his sons, if you are united, what was it? Yeah, if you are of one mind and unite to assist each other, you will be as this bundle, uninjured by all the attempts of your enemies. Paul says, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Verse 11. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say that they were baptized in my name. And Paul's hilarious. <laughs> he adds, oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. Verse 17, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. He says in verse 18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Now, if you're listening online or if you're here 
and you haven't fully understood the work of the cross, what God did through Jesus on the cross, his death, his resurrection, let me just make it super, super simple and clear. There was no way, there is no way for us to go to the Father and to, to be in the presence of a holy God on our own. God had to make a way, and Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father as a, as a perfect, blameless, holy sacrifice to take on all sin Amen. in himself, carry it to the cross, and have it nailed there. That we could be free from the power of sin. Yes, Father. Free from the power of sin. And then he rose from the grave so that we would also be free from the power of death. Mm -hmm. That we could spend eternity with him. That's the work and the power of the cross. Yes. In its most simple form. And Paul says, we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Everything hinges on what Jesus did on the cross. In verse 19, as scripture said, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? We've been hearing a lot from the wise people of the world recently, right? Mm -hmm. Where does this leave them? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God, in his wisdom, listen to this. God, in his wisdom, saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Amen. Verse 22, it is foolish to the Jews who ask for a sign from heaven, or ask for signs from heaven. And it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those who are called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. Mm -hmm. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Amen. We talked about that last week. I mentioned it this morning as well in review. Unity in the physical is good and we can accomplish great things. But unity in the spirit and in the word of God mm -hmm. and in the body of Christ... God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Paul goes on in verse 26. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Verse 30 <clears throat> makes it super clear. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him, Jesus, to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He, Christ, made us pure and holy. And he freed us from sin. 
Therefore, as the scripture said, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Amen. 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 Father, I commit your word and the reading of your word to the hearts of your people. God, change our hearts as we look at your word. Lord, humble us. Humble us as we look at your word. Open our hearts and our minds to receive, God. That we would become more and more like you and your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, let's see if my clicker is going to work. Hey, it is going to work. So, as Pastor Sandra uh, detailed for us a couple weeks ago in her message, The Spirit of Independence, if you missed that, go watch it, because it was good. She explained to us that the spirit of unity is not something that the world views as being wise. See, the world doesn't value unity because <laughs> the world promotes independence, Right? And be your own person. And do your own thing. And to, you know what, with everybody else and what they think. Right? Is that true? Yeah. That's, that's the reality. It's like, forget everybody else. I'm going to do me. And what's, what's good for me. The world teaches us this. It trains us to be self-sufficient. You could, okay, you could say the world or you could say life trains and teaches, right? It's kind of the same thing. Life teaches us to be self-sufficient, to rely on ourselves and our ability to see things and understand things and make moves and make it happen, right? That's, that's what the world, that's what life teaches us. We're conditioned from childhood to look out for our own interests first and foremost. I don't know if you're consciously aware of that. But we're conditioned to do that. We give our selfishness then as we get older, right? So as kids, we're just, we don't, we're not consciously thinking about it. We're just selfish people. But then as we get older, we make up more agreeable names to talk about our selfishness so that we don't feel selfish. We make up better words to use. Things like, I'm just being responsible. <laughs> or I'm just trying to be independent. You know? Take care of myself. Or people talk about someone being self-made. Well, this is a self-made man. Yeah. Because that's what, that's what we're taught to put value on. The world teaches us to think about ourselves first and others second. And unity, catch this, unity is only seen as something valuable if it can help you achieve your goal. The only time we're really concerned with being unified with anybody else is if we're trying to achieve something and we need some other people to come alongside of us to get it done. For real, for real, as Pastor Phil would say. <laughs> because we're selfish. We are. I, I mean, maybe it's not as difficult as it is for you to admit it, that you're, you're selfish, but it's hard for me. It's hard for me to admit that I am a selfish person and that more often than not, I'm going to default to wanting what's best for me first. But I ha we have to be aware of that, right? Before we can, before anything can change, we have to see it for what it is. But check this out. Through Jesus, through Jesus, God has offered us a better way of living. A better way than the way we've been trained and taught and conditioned by life. A better way. And in God's way of living... We should actually see other people, and even people who are different than us, come on somebody, even people who are different than us, in the light of eternity. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus, we have to see people in light of eternity. Not based on anything else. No physical thing, 
No personality thing. Only in light of eternity, because that's the way God sees them. And in God's way of living, we should consider others better than ourselves. This is a better way of living that God has given us. It's a better way to live, to think of others as better than ourselves, because it teaches us to trust that God is for us, and that God is going to take care of what we need, the things that we would have previously made happen, right? And we would have been self-made, and we would have been independent, and we don't need anything from anybody, right? Because we can handle our own business. God will provide all of our needs. And it teaches us to trust him. You might be one of these people, I hope you're not. But some people will actually get offended when you suggest that Christians should think and live this way, selflessly. In this united we stand, divided we fall. Some people will actually get upset. When when you from Scripture, remind them that they should actually be looking out for the interests of others first, above their own interests. Paul even mentions this. Paul calls this out specifically in verses 20 through 28. Go back to that. Verses 20 through 28. We're going to pull out some, some key things here. In verse 20, Paul asks us this question. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters when we say you should not think about your own interests, you should think about the interests of others and be united in what the Word of God says? You see, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God, it looks foolish I'm sorry, the wisdom of this world, let me, let me switch it. The wisdom of this world looks foolish when the light of God shines on it. So we have, we have philosophers, scholars, brilliant debaters in this world. And there's nothing wrong with those things. But when the, when the light of God shines on it, it's like nothing. It has no substance. It has no power. It's kind of just empty thoughts. And in verse 21, Paul makes it clear that no amount of human wisdom can ever allow you to know God. You can know about God through intellect and through reading the Bible and human wisdom. You can know all about God, but to really know God and to have his heart takes more than just knowledge and, and wisdom. To really be united with God through his word, it requires the Spirit. It requires the Holy Spirit. And that's a free gift for all of us. Jesus said it was better for him to go so that he could send the helper, the Holy Spirit, because we need it. We need the help of the Holy Spirit to, to go beyond earthly wisdom, to go beyond our own human intellect and ability to understand it. Is everybody? Yes, amen. amen. And you can have that gift. You can walk in that gift with the Holy Spirit. In verse 22, it says, <laughs> it's foolish to the Jews. I don't know if you talk to people about your faith and what you believe at all. Some of you might shy away from it because of your perception of how they're going to hear what you believe but there's a lot of people that like would literally be like okay <laughs> you know okay that's yeah if you want to believe that stuff that's fine but like that's dumb like basically they're basically like you're dumb <laughs> right like that's a whole bunch of nonsense there's there's no god like if it makes you feel better to believe that like that's cool you do you, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't know if any of you have experienced someone reacting to you like that, but it can make you shy away from even telling people, you know, that you believe and that you, you follow the Lord. Some people 
will only, <laughs> some people will only believe God if they see a miraculous sign. Oh, yeah. As a new, as a new believer, as a new convert, I, I was like all fired up, right? And I would still go and hang out with my old friends while they party. Because I was like, you know, you guys need to, you guys need to experience this, like this yes. freedom. And like my eyes have been opened. Like, I'm not going to tell you my whole testimony, but it felt like I couldn't see. And then all of a sudden through the work of the Holy Spirit, it was like I could see and I could see my life for what it really was. And I could see my own heart and the condition of my own heart and how hard and cold and dead it was. And God gave me a new heart. It, it talks about it in the Word of Amen. God. Yes. Taking our heart of stone and giving us a heart of flesh. That's what yes. happened to me. And I was so excited that I went back while my friends partied and tried to talk to them about Jesus. And I'm like, you guys are missing out. Like, this is so much, what I have is so much better than what you're doing. And one of my friends actually said to me, <laughs> he said, listen, I'll believe in God if he tears the roof off of this building right now. And proves himself to me. That's the only way I'm going to believe in God. Wow. And I, I was just sad, and I was like, "Well, I'm sorry, bro, but like, that's not going to happen." Yeah, exactly. That's not going to happen. Scripture says, "Don't put, don't put God to the test." Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know. Anyway, some people say God has to show me He's real, as if God somehow owes them evidence. Mm -hmm. Like that people think that God owes them something for them to believe in him. And then some other people, also in verse 22, some other people believe that God, well, they won't believe that God exists unless you can prove it to them in some natural term, in some physical way, right? Um, they'll say something like, well, if God exists, show me. Pro prove it, like scientifically or whatever. Now, if you guys know me, you know I like science. Mm -hmm. I'm a proponent of science. But some people are like, prove it scientifically as if God, the, the God, listen, the God who created everything out of nothing, as if somehow God is going to be explained to them through some scientific method. God created all of that. He doesn't owe us some, like, proof. He is. He is. Anyway. And God chose the things of this, the things the world considers foolish. I'm in verse 27 here. God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. Do you have anybody in your life that thinks it's foolish that you have faith in God? Yes. Do you have anyone in your life who thinks it's foolish that you pray? Mm -hmm. Here's a good one. Do you have anybody in your life who thinks it's foolish that you tithe? Yeah. What, what, are you, what are you giving money to the church and stuff for? Yeah. Don't you need it? Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're like, yes, I do, but I want to honor God with my finances. It's what the, you know, there's a lot of things that we do and we believe and, and we stand on because it's in Scripture that. People who we interact with are like, that's dumb. Right? And they might be nice and not come right out and say it, but they think it about you. <laughs> God chose these things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. Check this out. Let me break it down. God chose things like selflessness. Not selfishness. Selflessness. God chose these things, like sacrificial giving of ourselves. If you ever, you know, volunteered somewhere, or went on a missions trip, or you took time off of work, you know, to help somebody, something like that, like sacrificial giving. God chose these things. Um, I mentioned sacrificial giving of finances, tithes, offerings, alms, and even... Walking in unity despite differences. Walking in unity despite differences. The world doesn't see that as a super valuable thing unless there's a selfish ambition that is helped by that, right? People want to pull 
a whole bunch of people together when they're trying to accomplish something. And this is not a political sermon, but we're living a lot of that. We're hearing a lot of that right now. Where people will kind of say and do anything. And I'm not talking about one side or the other. This is across the board. People will say and do whatever to pull people together in unity to accomplish what they want. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. And you've heard it. You know, you hear the promises and you're like, well, they say a lot of things. God has chosen the things that he's called us to live out. Things that seem foolish in the world's eyes. Like, well, what are you going to accomplish like that? To shame those who think they are wise. And in verse 28, God has chosen the things that are despised by the world. Things counted as nothing at all. And he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. He uses those foolish things, those things that the world counts as worthless, in your life to bring to nothing what the world values, what the world considers important. We talked about this a little bit at Men's Breakfast on Saturday morning, and, and my brother John brought out a, a good point as we kind of talked about this, which was, which was selfishness. Kind of the root the root value, the root value that the world teaches us, like I said, is to think about yourself first and make sure that you're taken care of first, right? And that you get what you want first and foremost. But God takes, <laughs> God takes your selflessness, your humility, and he uses that to show other people this better way of living that he's designed. He uses you as an example to other people. You probably don't even have to speak a word. You can just be a living, breathing example of yes. a better way of living. Yes. Just simply by making sure your life lines up with what Scripture says. And how can you know what Scripture says? It's not a trick question. Read it. Read it. Just read it. Uh, Isaiah and I were, were talking this morning. I heard this great, uh, this great quote from Bill Johnson. He was talking about um, when, when, he, um, when he struggles, when, when someone is, is doing something or saying something about him that's, that's false, or um, you know, when, when he's just having an internal conflict, he says, I read until God speaks. Just, if you're not feeling it, or, you know, God's not speaking to you, or you're like, I don't know what I'm doing, just keep reading. Yes. Amen. Just keep reading. Just keep putting the Word of God in your mind and in your heart. And at some point, God is going to speak to you mm -hmm. yes, he will. through it. And it'll be at the right time, at the right place, just what you needed. And it'll come right from His Word, and you're going to know that it's true. Sometimes we struggle with, like, well, I don't... Like, we think things, or we feel things, right, in our emotions, and we're like, I don't know, is it God? I don't know. When you read it in the Word, it's like, they're, but, but it's God. Yes. Right? You don't have to worry about, am I being emotional, or is this just a thought that came into my head? If it's the Word of God, you can stand on it. Amen? Amen. Yes. When you're united with what God has said in His Word, you won't be divided at fault. You will stand. Okay? You guys, are you guys with me? See where I'm, yes. see where I'm going? Okay. All right. I want to be extremely clear about this point, though, before we move on, which is that God is calling his church, God is calling his church, you, to stand united in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand we're in the middle of an election cycle. I understand that there's a future that could be impacted one way or the other. I'm aware of all these things, Okay. I have the same concerns that maybe you have. But right now, God is calling his church to stand united in Jesus, yes. first and foremost. Because that's where our belonging comes from. And that's where our belonging will stay. As long as we don't allow ourselves 
to unite, right? What are you united with? What are you joined to? As, as long as we don't start belonging to or uniting ourselves with anything above Jesus, right? It's Jesus, and then we can have other affiliations and associations yeah. from there down, okay? But if those, if those affiliations and those connections and those belongings go against Jesus or the Word, then it's easy for us, right? It's like, oh, well, no, you have to, you have to submit to the to the Word of God and to Jesus, right? Because you, my belonging to this thing or you know whatever is less than my belonging to Jesus. Nothing is going to supersede that. That's that's where we have to live. So I want to be very clear about that point. Also, that God is not calling us, his church, to stand united. When I say united, I'm not saying that we stand united with every wind of new teaching. As Ephesians says, Ephesians 4, 14, if you want to look that up later. We're not called to stand united with every wind of new teaching or with lies that sound so clever. Lies so clever that they sound like the truth. We're not called to stand united with those things. We're called to stand, and I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. We're called to stand united on the Word of God. Period. And we're called to stand united in the Spirit. Which confirms the Word of God. Okay? You can say, oh, the Spirit led me to do this. Well, if it doesn't line up with the Word of God, no, it didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> Show me in the Word of God where it says that, you know, and then we'll talk about whether it was the Holy Spirit or not. We have to stand united on the Word of God and the Spirit of God, or else we start to get divided like the sticks, and we're easily broken. Right? United we stand. And divided we fall. I don't want to go off on a, too much of a tangent here, but I don't know if anybody saw in the news that um, the Pope came out with a statement oh, recently yes. 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 No. saying um, that it was going to, the church was going to recognize, uh, the, the church, the, the Catholic church all over the world should start to recognize um, what same I would sex. call non-traditional <laughs> same-sex uh, marriages or, or unions. Mm -hmm. Are we still part of one body, the church? Yes, we are. Do I agree with the Pope's interpretation of Scripture on that point? No, I do not. No. I do not. I feel like the Bible is pretty clear on that specific issue, and I don't want to get into it a whole lot, but I'm just using it as an example of when I say united, I'm not saying that we have to... Um, agree and partner with everything and everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just just making sure we're, we're clear on that. We will never partner together with sin, and we will never partner together with something that goes against the Word of God, right. where it's clearly spelled out in Scripture. Mm -hmm. We're not going to... Unity, again, unity doesn't mean that we're going to become like everyone else. It doesn't mean that we're going to be like the world so that like we can somehow like fit in fit, yeah fit in thank yeah. you <clears throat> we're not here to fit in god has set us apart that's, that's what the right. bible says mm -hmm. god says i have set you apart from all the other people of the world mm -hmm. nice. to be his mm -hmm. and jesus gave his own life to to make that possible that you could belong to god and we're not going to spit on that. We're not going to treat it like it's not important. In fact, you can make a note of this as well. I don't have a slide for it. Um, I already talked about Ephesians 4, 14. But Leviticus 20, 26, God says, You must be holy because mm -hmm. I am holy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I, the Lord, am holy. Now, if you remember earlier, I made this statement. I don't remember if it was in worship or in the sermon. It's like all kind of a blur. But uh, 
you cannot be holy in and of yourself. You are not capable of holiness on your own. You can do all the right things. You can say all the right things. You can know stuff about God. You can have it all together, and you can still not be able to be holy separate from Christ. Separate from Jesus, there's no holiness. Right. So when God says, you must be holy because I, the Lord, am holy, it's not like a list of like, do all these things and stay away from all these things and then maybe you'll be good enough to get into heaven. Mm -hmm. It's, I gave you my son, Jesus, to make you holy. What did you do with that? What did you do with this new life that I offered you? Did you live it? <clears throat> or did you just kind of fake it till you make it? God says, I have set you apart from all other people to be my very own. That's Leviticus 20, 26. So I'm going to, I'm going to start winding this down. Um, I want to give you three main points from today for your notes. One of my primary <clears throat> goals is that when I, when, when I share with you guys that it's not just Ryan talking, like Paul said, it's, it's not, you know, I follow Apollos or I follow Paul or I follow Peter. I don't want it to be me talking. I want you guys to go away from every time we get together with, with something, even if it's just one thing that you're like, I'm going to think about that, and I'm going to read scripture for myself about that. Something, something that you can take away and chew on and grow from. So, that's why I always encourage notes. We are stronger together. Like Paul said, let there be no divisions in the church. Number two. It's going to get there. <laughs> Selfishness and pride oppose godly unity. Selfishness and pride are in opposition to godly unity. But we have to admit that we're selfish and prideful first. Because selflessness, the opposite, is selflessness and humility. They actually produce unity. When we can all be selfless and help one another, like in the parable... We protect each other. We protect each other and we guard each other. And we don't let each other fall into sin, which leads to disunity, which leads to the breakdown of the family and of our nation. Number three, I can start clicking this thing earlier so that it can get through. <laughs> I was all proud of myself with the fancy transitions and now I have to wait for it. Number three. We have been united with Christ. Okay, remember, these are not just things that I'm coming up with as like a motivational speech. This is from the Word of God. Verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 1 says, God has united you with Christ Jesus. This is probably the most important point. Because if we forget this, or if we don't live like we've been united with Christ, then it's like we're pulling ourselves out from the bundle and just saying, go ahead and break me enemy. Our allegiance is to Jesus first. First and foremost, to Jesus. Amen. So I'm gonna, I think I have them all three, all three of them there for you. We're almost done, guys. Don't, don't, uh, don't wander off in your minds just yet. Everybody got those three points? Yes. We're stronger together. Selfishness and pride, we're going to flush those things out of ourselves, like doing a, a cleanse. Some of you have done cleanses, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> we're going to flush, flush that stuff out. Every time it pops up and you're like, ooh, that's, I'm being selfish. Kill it. <laughs> right away. 
Don't let it hang out with you. Kill it. And we've been united with Christ. First and foremost, we belong to him. Everything else has to filter through Christ. Okay? Here we go. How do we apply this to our lives? How do we apply this to our lives? What does it look like? What, you know, it's great to have concepts. It's great to understand something in concept, but you have to be able to flesh it out. You got to be able to walk out of here and, and have something that you can do with this. Okay. What does unity look like? What does unity look like in your home? With your family, your immediate family, your extended family. What does it look like? What does it look like to walk in unity? What does it look like for us to walk in unity as a church family? Mm -hmm. Knowing that we're all very different, okay? Again, if you missed last week, check it out. Because I, I broke all that down. How God has made us different and unique, and that's not in opposition to unity, to true godly unity. God made you the way you are because he wanted you to be that way with your personality and your strengths and your weaknesses, but we need each other and we need your differences. How does it look to walk in unity? 1 Peter 3, I'm sorry that's kind of small. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12, makes it so practical to understand what does it look like to live and walk in unity in the church, especially, okay? So if you want to dig deeper, you can look at, at this um, on your own at home. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 12. It says, <clears throat> finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. It doesn't say don't stand up for yourself. It says don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Yes, Lord. Yes. Instead, here's what you do. Pay them back with a blessing mm -hmm. when people insult you. When they tell you you're dumb for believing in God, or that oh, you must just be weak, that you need God in your life. Mm -hmm. If you were strong, then you wouldn't need God, as if that's somehow valuable. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It says, that is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. When you bless people that insult you, God blesses you. Yes, yes, Lord. When you stop being selfish and you start being selfless, God blesses you. Because now he's like, oh, I can, I can work with this. Right? For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, that gets two hands from me, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from speaking lies, from telling lies. Yes. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. <clears throat> United we stand. Divided we fall. What are we going to do? We're going to stand on the word of God. We're going to work on doing all these things that Peter lays out. First Peter lays out. Okay? I know we're not going to get it right all the time. We're going to apologize a lot to each other. And that's okay. If you're a parent, hear me. You need to be okay with apologizing to your kids when you screw up. 
because you are going to. And as we're learning <laughs> how to be united as a church family, we're going to miss it. We're going to make mistakes. There's going to be times when you're hurt or offended. And you might hurt or offend me or Pastor Joe or somebody else in the church. None of us are trying it, hopefully. But we need to learn from that, apologize, and move forward. <clears throat> and draw closer together, not spread out and separate and get divided and get broken. Right. All right. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> I'm going to be quiet because... I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm passionate about this, about unity, because I, I, see, I see it, the power that's there. It's there. It's like picking fruit from a tree. It's, like, it's right there. Just reach out and grab it. And I, I want it so badly for us. Because it's going to be so good as we grow in unity and we see the lies of the enemy and we fight against that deception, the, those lies that sound so good. They sound so true, but they're, they're there to divide us so that we can be conquered. We're going to fight against those things. And that unity, as we dig into the Word of God individually and together, that unity that's going to come the power that's going to come through the Spirit, through being unified in that, I can't, I'm just so, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to see what God is going to do. Amen? Amen. Yes. What God is going to do. So, if you're excited to see what God is going to do, then I'm going to invite you right now. We're going to just pray. I'm going to release a blessing over you. Not because I have a blessing to give, but God has put me in this position to be able to bless, Amen. Amen. right? To be able to bless. And so I want to, I want to give that to you as, as a gift today that you would be able to receive from his word. So if that's you, if you're excited to see what God is going to do, just stand where you're at. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to do anything embarrassing. I just want to bless you and love on you. Amen. Yes. Yes. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that your people are excited to see what you're going to do, God. Yes. We're like the family of Israel standing at the edge of the Red Sea, waiting to see what you're going to do, God. And we believe by faith according to your word. By faith according to your word, God, that you're going to make a way possible for us to live in unity, despite our differences, that you're going to make a way possible for us, Lord, to show the world a better way of living. God, I release that blessing on your people in this place and online this morning to live and walk in this better way that you've given us, God, to be selfless and humble in spirit, to look out for the best interests of others over their own desires, God, because I believe, according to your word, God, that when they return the insults with a blessing, that you are going to bless them. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And you're going to teach us to trust you in the process. You're going to teach us to trust you, that we don't have to defend you to anyone. We don't have to defend you to anyone, God. We don't have to defend ourselves to anyone because you, God, you do it. You are faithful. You are strong. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I thank you. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, that you are putting your word into the hearts of your people so that it can overflow out of them at the right place, at the right time. Yes, Lord, that you would be teaching us to keep our lips from speaking evil, to keep our mouths from speaking lies. Lord, that when our ears hear lies, we won't repeat them out of our mouths, but we'll call them out for what they are and make them submit, make them 
submit to the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God. Lord, I release your Word into the hearts of your people. Let it be fruitful and multiply as they talk with others this week. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, man. All right. Thank you, guys. I love you all so much. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God.